Oh, 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 look out here. They come. Give me that ankle. Oh, oochie, woochie. Mm, oh. Pat it all better. Mm, gun, gun, gun. <laughs> Did you hurt yourself? Oh, what happened? What happened then? Come on, boys. Come on. Hold it, hold it. Wait a minute. Oh, what a shot for the Sunday edition. Would you mind raising the skirt just a little bit? We want to show the injured ankle. Thank goodness she's got... All Paramount would give Brooks were two lines as a glamorous walk-on who disappears after the first scene in the film. Hey, hey. Yeah, and what's more, I'm going to send you the doctor's bill. Oh, you are, are you? You can't go around hurting girls' ankles like that. What do you think you are, a chiropodist? They crashed while eloping with a chorus girl. Snubbed by Paramount, Brooks was reduced to working for one of the minor studios, the Educational Pictures Company. Her rather shadowy director was William Goodrich, none other than the disgraced silent star, Fatty Arbuckle. Educational were makers of low-budget, two-reel program fillers. I got a job to do a film at Educational. I didn't know who the director was. I think they were two real comedies. I've forgotten what they were called. And I needed the money, so I took the job and I got into this outfit or whatever it was and went on the set and who was sitting there but Fatty Arbuckle sitting in a chair. He smiled at me and I smiled at him. I knew him and adored him, of course. Everyone did. And uh, he held a script in his hand and he sat in that chair, really. And, and uh, I swear to goodness, he didn't move through the direction, whatever. I think it took two weeks that long to make this silly picture. But he didn't move. He didn't pretend to be uh, happy or pleased or... Uh, he was really like the person who'd already died. You, you had that feeling. In 1936, Brooks made another desperate attempt to restart her career, but she was told she'd have to begin again in the chorus. This still was circulated with the caption, Louise Brooks, former star who deserted Hollywood seven years ago at the height of her career, has come back to resume her work in pictures. But seven years is too long for the public to remember, and Louise courageously begins again at the bottom. The quaint B series, The Three Musketeers, provided in 1938 the setting for Louise Brooks' last appearance in a Hollywood film. In the episode Overland Stage Raiders, she added romantic interest to the antics of the leading men, including the young John Wayne, whose career was about to take off as hers was about to finish. I think it's time you and I had some serious conversation. That's no lie. Why, you said that like you had the weight of the world on your shoulder. Maybe I have. Tony, there's something I've got to tell you. Something I should have told you a long time ago. Look, somebody jumped out. There's another one. Head back to the airport. I'll see what it's all about. I think Overland Stage Raiders is a little disappointing because Louise in that particular film had a fairly, even though she was the leading lady, had a fairly small part. And she had a totally new sort of modern hairstyle, so she didn't even look like the Louise Brooks we all knew. And it was rather a, you know, sad way to go out in a sense. They'll find a clause in that contract that says they can't take you away from Aura Grande. And that goes for you, too. Try to keep me away. If we need any more aviators, tell them about me and Wrong Way Corrigan. <laughs> By the early 50s, Louise Brooks had become a forgotten name. It was to this dingy area of New York's east side that a silent film enthusiast came in September 1955. It was such a, ter a terrible shock. Anyone who had looked the way she had to find that she was in the most deplorable, imaginable physical condition from having just lived on almost nothing but alcohol for years and years and years. She was enormously bloated. Her 
hair was unkempt, hanging around her face like the very witch of Endor. She wore those enormous frog-like space shoes and a rusty old overcoat that she called her, her uniform. I could make no connection. It was, uh, it was almost as though she were kind of a Lon Chaney in reverse, somebody so remote from the individual that I knew that it, it seemed unlikely that it was, was actually the same person. Obsessed by his vision of the former star, James Card set about the rehabilitation of Louise Brooks. Central to his strategy was moving her to the respectable town of Rochester, upstate New York, where he was curator of the Eastman Museum. It was in the museum's viewing theater that he showed Brooks many of her films for the first time, including the postscript to her European career, Miss Europe, which had finally been made as Prix de Beauté in 1930. Seeing her old films was a revelation for Brooks. She'd been contemptuous of her work as an actress, but now she began to reevaluate her life in films. Part of this process was to write about her screen experiences, at first for the Eastman Museum Journal. She became known among film enthusiasts and began to make occasional appearances at festivals. At the Louise Brooks season at the Paris Cinémathèque in August 1959, Henri Langlois declared, there is no Garbo, there is no Dietrich, there is only Louise Brooks. Her articles began to appear in film magazines in France and England. When she began to write, of course, she wrote for a whole series of magazines which were rather esoteric. They never had wide readership. And when Kenneth Tynan tracked her down and was able to write his really fabulous essay in the New Yorker. This changed everything. I thought for some reason that she may be dead because she hadn't made a film since I think 1938 and I was delighted to find she was alive and living in Rochester, New York in a two-room apartment in, not in poverty but uh, not in munificence either, living as an invalid, crippled with arthritis, in a state of extreme buoyancy, alone, but not lonely. The interest generated by Kenneth Tynan's New Yorker article brought about the publication of Lulu in Hollywood. Its worldwide success was an unexpected postscript to Brooks' career in movies. That's why I was never an actress. I never was in love with myself. I would go to a party and I'd see Dolores Del Rio and Constance Talmadge and, and Constance Bennett, all these beautiful women, I say, you're the ugliest one here. You're black and furry, you've got freckles, your dress is not as attractive. And in the end, so it, unless you can't be a great actress, unless you think you're beautiful, and you, uh, it's of the essence. And uh, I remember- I'm, I'm wondering what sense you mean a great actress, because- I mean a great actress. You're, but you're a contradiction of this. No, I'm not. To be a great actress, you must know what you're doing. When I write my little piece, I know exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. When I acted, I hadn't the slightest idea what I was doing. I was simply playing myself, which is the hardest thing in the world to do. Mm -hmm. you, you can give most actors any part in the world and they can play it. But this, they say, be yourself, they get terribly self-conscious. But since I never learned to act, I never had any trouble playing myself. 
The great art of films does not consist of descriptive movement of face and body, but in the movements of thought and soul transmitted in a kind of intense isolation. I played Pabst's Lulu, and she isn't a destroyer of men like Vedicans. She's just the same kind of nitwit that I am. Like me, she'd have been an impossible wife, sitting in bed all day, reading and drinking gin. Lulu's story is as near as you'll get to mine. <laughs>